so um so joe you know he said something um um on um on our meeting that we had um on thursday night that really um hit me it kind of made an impression on me he you know he sort um, of compared god to um a personal trainer that knows that you know you know that that he, he wants to get men more more out of us he knows that there is more in us and he's always encouraging us to come on one more push-up one more pull up, right? Right. It's like the personal trainer that knows that there's more in you and wants to bring it out of you. So I've been thinking about that and I've been thinking about the five words, it, you know, um, um, in my mind that have been resonating in me and that's getting to the next level. And I woke up the other day and I was like considering all of those people who I know in my life, who I consider are at the next, at the next level, you know? So um, obviously everybody knows, and I talk about it often that I believe that my mother's cooking is at the next level. And if anybody has ever had her food, they would be sure to agree with me. If not, I will just, you know, um, um, I'll have to break your legs. That's all. So, um, I used to do martial arts, so I trained under a guy who was like Bruce Lee good. He was sick. He was at the next level. He, there's, there's not one thing he did wrong. He had no weaknesses, you know. And um, I think my brother's voice and his range that he has is at the next level so you know um um if you know me very well and um if you know my wife debbie very well then you realize something that her patience is at the next level <laughs> right so everybody knows that that her patience with me is certainly you know like the creme de la creme of patience you know, it's like, I don't even know if God has anything on her. Kidding, Lord. <laughs> so I asked myself, well, what, what is it going to require of me to get to the next level in my relationship with God and to get to the next level in my faith? What does it require? And I realized that mainly I, I think, you know, I think that closeness with you know, God is up to us. Closeness with God is up to you. It's not up to anybody else. It's, it's like in your hands. It's up to us. So what does it take for us to get to the next level? I think two things are imperative. Two things have to happen. They have to happen. If they don't happen, it, it's never going to happen. They're, and, you know, of course, if you're doing a message or sermon, the things have to begin with the same letter and you have to have at least two points, right? So it's recognition and it's response. There has to be recognition and there has to be a response to that recognition, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I'm going to ask Sheena. So I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to try something. So I'm going to ask a question and I want, you know, I want your thoughts on it. So, so I'm going to ask a question, then Sheena's going to unmute everybody, and then she's going to mute everybody again. So, so when you think of somebody in the Bible, how should I put it? When you think of humility, somebody who recognizes God's sovereignty, God's, God's sovereignty, his rule, his reign, his love, his goodness. Like when you think of humility, who do you think of in the Bible other than, you know, Jesus? Sheena, unmute everybody. Jamie. Yeah. Oh, I thought that you raised your hand or something. Um, if you want to raise your hand or if you just want, raise your hand, man, if you got it. Bob. Bob. Moses. 
Moses. Moses. Okay, Claudia, what do you got? Same one, Moses. Moses. Yeah, Betty. Mike. Betty. Paul. 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 Mm. Oh. Mom. I can't. Um. John. Yeah. Go, Mom. I'm sorry, what was the question again? If you think of humility, a guy who is humble in the Bible, who recognizes God as being completely sovereign, in control, all good, who do you John think? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Dan, who do you got? Uh, Daniel. Daniel. Nice. Noah. Oh, Even said Noah. Maggie, who do you got? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. All right. How about yeah. Isaiah? Brandon, who do, who do you who do you have, man? Did you? Get off of the baby, Coco. Who? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's talking about the dog. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, without I'm being rude, me. I'm gonna ask Sheena. Mm -hmm. if you um um, if you mute everybody again. Somebody said I think Terry oh, okay. Somebody two. forgot about me. Eric, what about you? I was gonna say Paul. Paul. Okay. Then he said it. Mute him. Mute him. Okay, well when I think of somebody, right, who who in humility has recognized the complete rule of God and the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God, I think it's somebody that people don't normally think of, and I love this character, King Nebuchadnezzar. So I think of Nebuchadnezzar. And so I want to paint a picture really, really briefly, man, about my Nebuchadnezzar, right? So, so in Daniel, you know, it describes this king. He was the king of Babylon. So at that time, he was the king of all of the countries of the world. He was the head of all the peoples of the world. Babylon had control of, of all of the known world. So, so every kingdom was under him. And he was a narcissistic king, right? Obviously. So one day, you know, he made a golden idol. And he, you know, ordered that everybody at the sound of of the trumpet and of the lyre and of the flute would fall down whenever they heard that sound and would worship at this image that he made, this giant golden idol, okay? So he was really, really narcissistic. So I can go on and I can tell you all about, you know, him and about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but the point is this king was, thought he was God's gift to the planet Earth, that he was in control and he was a narcissist, right? So God one day humbled him and, you know, and sent him into, um, um, into the wild, you know, you know, and the Bible says that he became like a creature outside. He grew hair on his body. He grew claws on his finger. He ate and lived with the cattle and with the beast in a field for seven periods of time. I don't know what that was. It could be seven months. Um, it could be seven years, but his fingers grew like, you know, claws like an eagle is, you know, you know, hair on the back, hair all over his body. And he lived outside with, with um, animals. So, so in, so in general, it was God's way of humbling him and, you know, and letting him know that, that, you know, I am God, not you. So I just want to read something now. It's from Daniel chapter four, and it's verses number 34 through 37. So I'm going to have my wife come here and read it, and then I'm going to come back man, and share something. Come on in here. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High, 
I honored and glorified him who lives for even, forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven. And the peoples of the earth, no one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and, and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble thanks babe so yeah so every time i think of a, a you know guy in the bible you know jimmy john who who got it who recognized completely the sovereignty of god and who was humbled and said you are God. You are all good. You are all powerful. I think of this guy, Nebuchadnezzar, King King Nebi, um, you know, as I call him. So, um, so in verse number thirty-seven, there, um, there, um, um, there um, are two words that are key. So it says, "I, King Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven." Because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. So, you know, this is a guy who recognized that everything that God does is right, and all that he does is good. So are those two words in your vocabulary? Like, can you say right now, like, can you look back on all of the junk that happened in your life, all of the difficulties and all of the current difficulties, man, that you are going through right now. And can you honestly say that everything he does, has done, and will do is right? And all of his ways are good and just. Are those two words in your vocabulary? Because those two words need to be in our vocabularies. Because that's, that's a complete and utter recognition that everything he does is right and all his ways are good. And sometimes it takes a lot to get us to get us there. It took a lot for this king to get to the point. You know, I'm, you know, when I ask myself, man, what does it say about God that he would pursue a ruthless, evil murderer like Nebuchadnezzar? He murdered people. He was a murderer. He was a, you know, he was full of himself. Yeah, he was a narcissist. He was king of the whole world. So naturally he thought he was God's gifts to everything. But beyond that, he was a murderer. He killed people willfully. What does it say about God that he would pursue him year after year to the point where he got him? Where, where you know, he was interested. You know what it tells me two things? Tells me God loved Nebuchadnezzar. He loved Nebuchadnezzar. You know, it, he waited him out. He waited this guy out. Um, it says in Jeremiah chapter chapter 31, you know, 3, you know, it says that the Lord's love for us, he has loved us with an everlasting love. It says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that that he is patient, not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. It says in Song of Songs, chapter five, man, verse number eight, that that you know he says, "Go and tell my beloved that I am lovesick for her." So so, do you see God as a God who is lovesick for you and will wait you out, you know, until you recognize that He is all that. He waited Nebuchadnezzar out. He waited him out and reckoned, you know, you know, and he, you know, and then one day it's like the light bulb turned on 
And he came to his senses and he realized and he recognized, oh my God, all your ways are right. All your ways are good and just. You do whatever you want. You, 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 you have the right to do whatever you want because everything, because all are in my vocabulary now. Are everything and all in your vocabulary right now? The, the whole world is running scared. The whole world is running scared, you know, and we should be cautious and we should be careful and we shouldn't be foolish, but we should not be running scared, man. We should be recognizing that this God, that everything he does is right. Even in the midst of a pandemic, everything he allows and does is right. And all his ways are good and just. That's called recognizing. But you know what? That, that doesn't bring you to next level faith with, you know, Jesus. It doesn't transform, um, you know, um, transform um, our friendship with, you know, with uh, him to next level friendship. What transforms it, you know, it begins it, right? You know, it's a good beginning, a recognition of who he is, but there needs to be a response. It's equally as important, I man, if not, you know, I'm more. So, so, you know, every time I, so I'll say it again. So, you know, I've said it a thousand times, but it's deserving of saying a thousand and one. When I smell my mom's cooking, my response is to sit down at the table and say, Ma, can you give me a plate of that? When I saw my, when, you know, I went to the karate school. I saw this guy who was ambidextrous. He was equally as good with the left foot and the right foot, with the left hand and the right hand. His skills were amazing. So I, my response was, I want to train under this guy. I see this leadership team of, you know, of Matthew, of Sheena, you know, of Mark and Joe and Bob and all of the people who are part of this leadership team. And I realize that these people are special, that they have something to contribute that I can't, that is special, that they're important to me. So, so I want to say, you know, uh, how do I respond to that? The best way I can respond to that is to, you know, is to honor their love and their friendship and their worth by saying, you call me out. If you see anything in me that doesn't look like Jesus, you have the right to call me out on it. That's the best way I can honor it. You know, so Psalm 139 verses 23 and 24. Everybody knows it. It's the powerhouse Psalm. It's the Psalm with muscles. So if you want to turn to it, I'm just going to read it. It's Psalm 139. I'm just going to read the two verses. This is what our response should, should, should uh, be when we recognize that everything he does is right and all his ways are good and just. This is, this is what I believe what our response should, should uh, be. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. So I'm reading from, uh, I'm going to read from the NIV version. So it's King David, and he says this. He says, he says, O Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart. And Lord, test me and know my anxious, anxious anxious thoughts and, and see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. So I'm going to read it one more time. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Lord, test me and know my anxious, anxious thoughts and see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. So I've been married now 25 years. I'll be married in July, 25 years. And, you know, and one of the things that I have recently said to Debbie, and, you know, I think I asked you this about a year ago, you know, I turned to Debbie and I said, Deb, is there anything in me that drives you crazy? And that, you know, I, you know, you know, is there anything I do that really, really bugs you? 
and at which she had a list, you know, about a mile long. So when, you know, if you recognize, I mean, that somebody is of such value and that they're so good and that everything minute they do is right and good, your response should be, Lord, is there anything I do that, that bothers you? Anything that I do that you don't like, that doesn't line up, Lord, that bugs you. It's the same thing. I love Debbie and I value her, you know, her love. So I ask her, is there anything I do that bugs you? So are we asking God, Lord, is there anything we, I, I am doing, thinking, saying, feeling that drives you crazy, that bugs you, Lord? That's the response. I think, you know, I think that we should all get to, you know, and, and, you know, what the thing about it is, is that it's completely up to us. Nobody can, you know, no one can ever do that for you. Right. Like there has to be a recognition of who this wonderful God is. No one can do that for you. There has to be a, there, there, you know, has to be a, um, 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 you know, a response of Lord, anything in me that drives you crazy and that bothers you, show me Lord and lead me in your ways. No one can do that, but you. So closeness to, to a him is up to you. And, and you know what? I, I want to challenge everybody. I want to challenge me that I want to use this time. Listen, man, you know, this is a time out for us all. This is a time out. This Zoom meetings and these other meetings, thank God for them, but they're no substitute for the body of Christ getting together and fellowshipping. This is a weak substitute for, you know, church, I mean, as far as I'm concerned. But I'm, you know, grateful for it. But let's use this period of time. It's a time out for us to recognize everything he does is right. All he does is good. And for us to respond, you know, like in saying, Lord, if there's anything in me that bugs you, show me and lead me in the way of everlasting. 